All right, turn your Bible to James chapter 1. I'm a little nervous tonight. Um, this is my first time uh, preaching with my... Uh, I, we, on staff here, I'm able to get access to the, the web, and I can... I don't, like, I don't have it saved on my tablet. I, I'm just... I'm, so, so just to be sure, I printed off the paper copy. So I'm, I'm sure that, you know, technology is going to fail me, but just in case, well, I'm prepared. And then, and then I saw Pastor Folger walk in, so my... My nervous level just went up a little bit more after that, so you pray for me as we get into it. The other thing is, this is my first time preaching as, um, as being on staff, and boy, you just feel like if you're getting paid to study, you ought to be you know, doing a good job preaching, I would think. So I feel like the, you, know, you, get, you better bring your A game here. Uh, so uh, with the help of God, I'm, I'm excited. Um, uh, the first day I came into work, boy, that's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. To say I get to work here. First day I came into work, I started studying. And uh, I asked God, I said, um, I said, Lord, I just, I want to be prepared. If I'm ever called on to preach, I want to have something ready. I want to keep my mind fresh. I just want to you know, have something new. And the Lord brought me to the book of James. And I just started uh, uh, thinking about that and praying about that. And, and started putting together a couple messages. And uh, a few weeks back, Pastor Pete asked me to preach. And I was just, just thrilled. Um, as I get into this, really, I think about the book of James. I, w- I would title this study, the series of messages, as the Lord gives me liberty to preach, that uh, I would title it, Faith That Is Evident by Fruit. Faith That Is Evident by Fruit. We find that the book of James is believed to be the first epistle that was written in our New Testament. And I would, I would, I would find a, a key verse or a central thought throughout the book. I would actually find it in chapter 2. Look, look at verse number 17. Actually, I think I have it up on the screen there. Sorry for the small print there. But uh, even so, faith, if the half not works, is dead being alone. I think that's the message that James is trying to get, a, get across. So you know, here's the thing. I've, I've, been, I've been praying. I've been ready and, and preparing and getting ready. It's, I'm, I'm excited to preach, and I'm reminded of the first time I rode a dirt bike. Uh, Larry Clare was about three years older than me. I grew up in a small town of about 600 and we had some railroad tracks, even in a small town. And Larry and his family, they were on the other side of the tracks. And they were just, uh, they were just, they were just rebel rousers. We had a good time. Uh, they were somewhat troublemakers, and that's why I kind of gravitated towards them. I wanted to be around them. Larry was about four years older than me. I believe when school let out, the day he stepped off the bus, he took his T-shirt off and didn't put it back on until when school went back on in the fall. So Larry's got a dirt bike, and I'm excited. And I said, hey, give me a ride. And he said, sure. So he got on. He said, hold on. And I thought, well, man, you're not wearing a shirt. That's kind of weird. I don't want to hold on to you. So, so here's what I did. I just, I just held on to my legs, right? And he said, uh, and off he went, and off I went. <laughs> Listen, I feel, I, I, I feel like I've, I've, been, I've been praying over this. I've been charged up, and I feel like if, if I'm not careful, I'm going to take off and leave you. So listen, I know it's summertime. I know you've been working. I, I know you have a lot on your mind. I know you may be uh, even thinking about this. some of you have entrusted uh, the, the staff of the Cleveland Baptist Church with your children, and that's probably uh, weighing on you. I, I get it. I know that. But I'm going to ask you for just for the next 30, 35 minutes, stay with me, okay? Uh, I, I believe God, God's given me a message here. We started, we started a few messages, and I just kept coming back to this, to this, this idea. Um, I, I started to think about this. Let, let's just get into it. J- James chapter 1, look at the first four verses here. The Bible says here, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. He says here, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I had it in my mind that I wanted to preach you know, an encouraging letter from, from, a, from the apostle to the church. And, and we find this as, as he's writing to this scattered church. They're scattered for a reason. They're being persecuted at home. Uh, they're being persecuted for their faith. And, and, and God puts it in James' heart to, to write this, this epistle to them. And, and, and I, I just can't escape the first, the first statement. He says here, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I even got into my third message in the series, and God just kept bringing me back to this point and convicted me of the thought, are you a servant of me and of my son, Jesus Christ? So with God's help tonight, 
I want to I want to preach this. I want to talk about this idea that of being a servant of God. So would you pray with me as we get into the message? Our Father, we love you. God, we thank you for the wonderful, wonderful word of God that we have. Lord, that we can go to it in times of trouble. We can go to it for times of encouragement, we can times of rejoicing. We can go to it for edification and exhortation. Lord, we're thankful that we have the word of God tonight in this Wednesday night Bible study and prayer time. And Lord, we've had our prayer time, a good season of prayer. Uh, Lord, to uh, demonstrate our desire, our need for you, our humility, God, that we can't do anything of any eternal value without you. And Lord, now it's time for preaching. So, Father, I pray that you'd fill me with your power. Lord, that you'd hide behind the cross. Lord, that you would help me tame my tongue not to say anything you'd not have me to say. Lord, I, I believe we're in agreement about everything that's going to be said tonight. So, Father, I pray that you'd help me. And, Lord, that uh, the uh, people here would be challenged with this idea of being a servant of you. Lord, help us understand just a little bit more tonight of what that means and the implications in our lives and our everyday lives. So, Lord, uh, just bless the preaching time now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And, you know, as you and I sit here uh, tonight, we all have a title. We all have, uh, uh, whether it's a, um, a parent, whether you're uh, a spouse, whether you're a boss, whether you're an employee, you have a, you're, you're a manager, uh, you're a bus worker, you're a teacher, a helper, that title, it, it, in some ways, it helps define your role and your responsibilities. Would you agree with that? Would you agree? We, yeah, that, that title defines it. You understand this, and most of us have gone through this. As, as that title changes, so does your role and your responsibility. I, I can remember uh, the day we found out that uh, uh, we were going to have a son. Well, everything changed when I, when I found out I was going to have a son. I can tell you, uh, two months before he was born, that was my last drop of alcohol. See, th- things changed. It was no matter, it was no matter just, it wasn't a matter uh, of things of just me and my life and the implications of just my life. No, no, but my, my role, my title is going to change. Thus, because my title changes, my role, my responsibilities change. And so as, as we think about this idea of, of a title, uh, you know, James gives himself uh, this title uh, as, as a servant of God. And, and I, I would submit to you that he is accepting of this servant. He's accepting of this title. He's, 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 he's understanding just exactly uh, what that title means. And I, I w- uh, would remind you of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So as we look at this, we, in essence here, we see that he is acting out the, the role and the title that God has given him. As a servant of God, you are to serve God's people. He's, he's going to write this letter of encouragement to a church that in a very troublesome time needs some words of encouragement. Listen, he's going to write this letter to a, to, to, to a church of people that are losing family members, uh, people that are losing uh, uh, their career, they're losing their homes. It's a troubling time, and I think we can, we can relate to that uh, just a little bit. But don't miss this. Just because he's a servant of God, he, he's actually going to be inspired by God to write this epistle to the scattered church by way of encouragement, exhortation, and edification. These believers are currently displaced. Some of them are, are probably discouraged. Some of them may even possibly questioning their faith. Why is it they would do it? Listen, I have to believe that there are some children that are coming alongside as their parents have made decisions to be a follower of Christ. The, the children are looking around and say, why are we doing this? Why are we continuing to do this? Nobody else is doing this. Why can't we stay here with our friends? It's a troublesome time. And he's writing this as a servant of, the Lord, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, doing what servants do. They just serve. So as we think about uh, in my, my previous uh, career in the corporate world, we would get different titles. And it's funny, every, it seemed like every two years, they throw out a different title. But the roles never changed. It was always the same thing. See, the, 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 there was a flawed perception in that. And am, am I the only one that's, that's gone into a, to a public restroom and uh, you got the soap on and you're waiting for the water to turn on and you rub it, you kind of move the hand around a little bit and the water never turns on because there's a handle. You see, it, it doesn't matter what's going on in my mind. Listen, it doesn't matter what's going on with the actions that I'm taking. Nothing I'm doing will ever change the fact that that faucet is not a touchless faucet. I'm going to have to extend my hand and turn that water on. What I'm saying is, just because we say something, or just because we think something, it does not make it a fact of reality. And we think about this idea, James is writing to them. Remember, our, our, our key, the key, uh, key verse to, to the book of James, I believe, again, in, in uh, 
Chapter 2, verse 17, even so faith that hath not works is dead, being alone. Like you, you just can't say it. It has to be flushed out. It has to be lived in everyday life. Uh, we think about the uh, Noah Webster uh, uh, di uh, Dictionary, uh, 1828, uh, defines the word servant as one that is bound, one in a state of subjection, a person who voluntarily serves another, one who yields obedience to another. In Scripture, the saints are called servants of God or of righteousness, and the wicked are called servants of sin. Reading one of the commentators, I have this wonderful program that the church gives me. It's amazing. It has so many, so much information. Like, I can just study. Like all, I, I tell you how much I love to study. I'm so glad to have this position. I'm reading one of the commentators, and it says, In the original Greek language, it signifies in bondage. It also translates bond in contrast to free. Like sometimes we'll use the, the, the contrast to help understand the meaning. Thus, we can conclude the use of servant is of lowly and humble designation. In the apostles' time, it would not have been something that one would aspire to, but rather one was reduced to the role of servant. And the apostles called themselves a servant of Jesus Christ. We find this in Paul's writing, in Peter's writing, in Jude, and also here in the book of James. And I put in bold in my notes here, a servant serves. Well, what does it mean to serve? We're going to get into the message here in a little bit. I have to lay some groundwork here. What does it mean to serve? It means to work for. It means to bestow the labor of body and mind in the employment of another. In Scripture and theology, it means to obey and to worship, to act in conformity to the law of a superior and treat them with due reverence. We say this all the time. We'll go in, into, uh, maybe you're at the airport, or maybe you're at a Starbucks or in line at the gas station somewhere. You'll see someone in uniform. And what do you do? You walk up and say, hey, Thank you for your service. And I think it's right. For, I think we ought to do that. I think they ought, they ought to be commended for that. Uh, we'll see a veteran with a hat on, and we'll go up and we'll shake their hands. And I try to, I try to uh, train my children up like that. And, hey, you see a veteran, you know, uh, God gives you liberty. Go up and shake their hands. Tell them thank you for their service. We think about this, and as we think about this young uh, soldier that we thank for their service, we see a physically fit soldier in uniform as a picture of humility and selflessness uh, but we do not see the, the hours of submission, both physically and mentally, that that soldier has put into their military career. We don't get to meet that friendly person called Mr. Drill Sergeant, right? We don't get to see, we don't get to see the countless hours of practice and drill and extreme conditions that push these men, and limit to, these men and women to their physical limits. No, we just see the finished product, and we say, thank you for your service. We know very little of the separation from their families, very little from the separation from the outside world as they go and prepare. Now, we've seen that here recently as some of our, some of our young people have gone off in the military. And, and man, it's, it, it, like you don't get to talk to them for, for a while. We, we, we don't get to see that when we, when we go up and we see this. So th this is a, a very sobering thought. As you and I sit here today, we're either serving the Savior or we're serving ourselves. That's the truth. We're all there, we, we make a choice. We sing this in glory stars. We all make choices throughout the day. Some choose to follow while others stray. The Lord has told us what to pursue. So choose to follow in all the way that you do. Choose right when the sun is shining. We're, we're teaching your young people to make right choices. I, I think that's a good song, a good congregational song for us as adults. We have to recognize that we're making a choice. We must ask ourselves a question today, and I ask myself as I'm preparing for this, am I a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ? Listen, for those of us in ministry, am I a servant of Jesus Christ? Or have I simply found a way to do something that I love to do and called it a career? For, uh, for our young people here, am I a servant of Jesus Christ? Or have I figured out what steps to take and what behavioral modifications to make to keep my parents off my back and out of my business? For the, the parents here, uh, am I a servant of Jesus Christ? Or have I just simply found a way to keep my family together and preoccupied with Christian busyness, hoping to keep my children out of trouble? This applies to everyone, this question. Am I a servant of Jesus Christ? Or am I making calculated decisions to please everyone and everyone else without truly serving Christ? It's a convicting question. I, I just couldn't escape it. I couldn't escape it. God kept bringing this back. Are you a servant of Jesus Christ? Are you a servant of God? Hold, hold your place there in James. Go to 1 Kings chapter number 18. We find here the example of a servant demonstrated in Scripture. In 1 Kings chapter 18, look with me in verse number 36 and verse number 37. 
Elijah is going to pray his, his prayer to call down fire from heaven. In 1 Kings chapter 18, look at verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and watch this, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art Lord, the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. So we find here, in, in the, as a servant is demonstrated in Scripture, notice the obedience of the servant. As Elijah prayed, he said, I have done all these things at thy word. Also notice the objective of the servant. First is to glorify God. Secondly, to direct the hearts of the people to the Lord. So I ask you this question, are we a servant of God? Are we obeying all things at his word? Are we glorifying God in our lives? Are we directing the hearts of the people to the Lord? But then I just couldn't get away from this thought. James here, he says here, go back to James chapter 1. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I pulled out my dictionary again, and I looked, and I find that the word of is a preposition. Now, we all know this, but I want you to think about this. The, idea, the, the definition of, of the word of means from or out of, proceeding from, as the, cause, the, as the cause, the source, the means, the author, the agent bestowing. We say that of, it denotes property or possession, uh, and, and that which, that which is, uh, proceeds from or is produced by a person. So if I were to say this, I would say, okay, I'm going to pour uh, water out of the craft into the glass, right? So the water is coming out of here into here. The, the idea here that what James is saying here, he's saying that, uh, that he's a servant of God. James, God. Servant of that which is proceeding out of God into James. So uh, when we think of the word of, it, also, it has one primary sense, from or departing or issuing, proceeding from or out of. It means, again, denoting possession or property. James tells us through inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he is a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not attributing this title of role, or this, uh, this responsibility that he has of the servant by any means of his own volition. This is not a, uh, you know, something that he's manufactured. It's not something that he's worked up. He's just simply saying he's a servant of God. He's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. This servanthood is bound by none other than God himself. God is doing this work in James' life. God is making these things possible, of course, by the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. We understand this. But God has set him apart. God in Jesus Christ has called him to encourage and to edify and to exhort the saints. God, you see this? God is doing this work. God has made him a servant. What I'm, what I'm saying is, that takes a burden off of my back. I don't have to fulfill that obligation. Now, we'll talk about our responsibility, but it's God that's going to do that work. The question is, will I allow him? That's the question that we have to deal with. So I would submit to you that it's God that, if you, if you and I are ever going to be a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, God is going to have to do that work in our lives. And we have to recognize that God has given us a free will. And as we sit here tonight, we've all made a choice of who we're going to serve, either in the past, who we're serving present, or who we're going to serve in the future. So the question is, will you be a servant of self or be a servant of the Savior? Well, if I'm going to be a servant of Jesus, this is a decision point. I have to ask myself, why would I want to serve myself? Why serve, why serve sin? Why, why, why serve our flesh? Uh, uh, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 1 and verse number 2, that we're to cease from sin. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh... Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Why, why, why would we want to choose to serve, sin, to serve self? We're told, we're, we're told in Scripture we're to cease from sin, but we're also told that we're to crucify the flesh. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one to the other, so that you cannot do that you would. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions, verse number 24, with the afflictions and the lusts. Well, I'm sorry, with the affections and lusts. He goes on to write in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, and said, Paul's writing here, he says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. 
I'm going to stand before you today and I'm going to make, a, make an argument for you why, and present evidence of uh, why would you want to serve the self and the flesh when we have an opportunity to be a servant of God. Next point we'll point out here is that we're to be crucified with Christ. Turn your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 6. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible, Romans chapter 6. It's hard to, boy, it's hard to pick a verse out of Romans chapter 6 without reading the whole thing. But we're, we're going to do our best here. Let's look at just the first, uh, first two verses, and then we'll go down to uh, verse number 6, down through verse number 11. And the Bible says here, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Go down to verse number 6. We're making, we're, we're making the argument here of why become a servant of self? Why be a servant of sin? Knowing this, verse number 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Look at verse 11 here. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We think about this. Sin has no power over Christ because Christ was sinless. It wasn't even a battle. He didn't have to give up sin. He was sinless. He, had, he, he was able to conquer sin and death so that we could have the victory. Romans chapter 8, verse number 2. The Bible says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Quick word about that, the, the word reckon that's used there in verse number 11. Paul says, Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed. So basically what he's saying here is you know, to, to count or to consider or to regard, to come to a conclusion. It, it just makes sense. It just makes sense. Of all the evidence that has been provided, it just makes sense that you would no longer want to serve self or serve sin. You would actually want to serve the Savior. We that name the Lord as our Savior, we're freed from the bondage of sin. Hallelujah. We're no longer serve this old man. We're freed to be a, sa- a servant of the Savior. We're actually called to be a servant of the Savior. Look at uh, verses 12 uh, down through verse number 14. We're freed from sin. Paul goes on to write here. It says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield yourselves, yield ye your, your, your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Uh, look, uh, so we find here, we're no longer bound by sin, and we're, we no longer serve sin. So we're free from sin, but we're also freed to serve. Look at verse number 16. He says here, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from that heart the form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Look at uh, verse number 22. But now be made free from sin and become servants to God. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So I'm to be bearing fruit of holiness. I'm to be freely serving the God. But I just couldn't get away from that word yield. And what that word yield means. It means to give up the contest. It means to submit. It means to comply with. It means to to give away, not to oppose. Isn't it amazing that God has to tell us that we are not to oppose him? The one who saved us. The one who redeemed us. Listen, ladies, that's like you you fixing a good meal and your kid's saying, I don't like that. No. No, you're going to eat it. Mom made it. It's good. It's good. You're going to eat it. You guys didn't like that. That's okay. We made our kids eat it. Well, the boys did. The girls get away with too much, I guess. All right. We've gotten weak. They, they, they wore us down. That's probably what happened there. But I want you to think about this idea of yield. It means, it means to give as a claim of right. You realize when you get on 480, this may surprise some of you, but you're supposed to yield before you get on there. All right? You understand that? As they're going, they have the right of way. You're supposed to yield. 
By the way, you can't, you can't come back the next day and say, hey, I'm good on the whole yield thing. I yielded yesterday. No, no. Every time you get on, like if you happen to get on 482 or three times during the day, you are to yield each day. Listen, here's what I'm saying is in the Christian life, I can't, it's not enough to say, well, I came down to the altar. I trusted Christ as my Savior. I've been baptized. I'm serving. I'm doing this. I'm, no, no. It, it, it's, it's a constant state of yielding to God's will in my life. If I'm going to be a servant of God, if you are going to be a servant of God, listen, James is not preaching to preachers. So you can't, we can't sit back and say, well, that's good for Pastor Pete because, boy, he's leading, he's leading the Cleveland Baptist Church. But that's just not for me. I'm going to do my part. No, no. We're all called to be servants of God. Amen. And God is going to do that work. It's of God in our lives. Yielding is a daily moment by moment. Dear Christian, can I remind you that you've been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ? I believe it's quite proper and quite fitting that we would yield ourselves to the Lord's work. I also remind you of our key verse. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So we're asking ourselves this question. Am I a servant of God? Who am I serving? Am I serving self or am I serving the Savior? There is no middle ground here. It's one or the other. I'm hoping, it's my desire tonight, that that, that question resounds in your mind as you leave here. And you, and you pillow your head tonight. And maybe you talk as a family and say, hey, what do you think about that? Can it be said of us that we're servants of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ? Maybe there's some things that we can do. Listen, just because, just because I say I'm a runner does not make me a runner. You understand? I can, I can go buy running shoes. I can buy running pants. And I can even go out and run. But that doesn't make me a runner. To make me a runner, I'm going to have to get out and hit the, pave, hit the pavement. i got to run. That's just how that works. Uh, a few weeks ago, I got the bright idea, encouraged by uh, some people uh, that I, I feel dearly about. I said, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little exercise, and I'm going to jog. And uh, I liked to die that first time. I thought, man, this is not good. My face got all red and blotchy. Man, I'm huff and wind, and we, I, we lived there off of uh, Puritus, so we go down that hill, and I had to come back up that hill, and I'm old enough, I should know how these things work, and uh, so the next time I went out, I said, I'm going to take Calvin with me, because the dog went with me the first time, and I said, if I die, someone has to carry me back home, <laughs> so I'm going to bring Calvin with me, and uh, Calvin, you know, he's being pole, he can run, you know, and uh, so we get down to that hill, I said, son, I'm, I'm going to try to make it up that hill, and I said, but here's the deal, I'm probably not going to make it, but don't wait for me. You just keep going, but I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep movement going. Like, I don't want to give up, right? I, I, I want to do this. So I'm going to jog, and when I get to the point I can't, I'm, going to, I'm just going to walk. But you just stay up there. Well, he sure enough, he got ahead of me, and I started walking. And the dog, I think the dog had more loyalty than my son. The dog didn't want to leave me. The, 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 he's stretching the leash, all, and the dog's looking at me like he's looking at Calvin, looks at me, like, come on. And so we get up there. Well, we got home that night. I said, this is the beginning of June. And I said, son, here's the deal. I want to challenge him. I like, I like to uh, challenge. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conquer that hill before the end of the month. Boy, men are dumb sometimes. <laughs> we just kind of say things off the cuff. Yeah, I'm going to conquer that hill. No, man, what do you... I, we got camp, we got this going on, we can't, no, I, I, I'm not a, I don't exercise, no, what, what was I thinking? Why did I make that commitment to my son? And, and thankfully, he forgot about it. He never brought it up. <laughs> driving home that last Sunday night of June, driving home, it's a nice night, and that thought came to my mind. Oh, oh. I said I was going to conquer that hill. Mm. Sunday night, boy, that's usually like, you know, lay on the couch and have some ice cream and maybe watch a little film or something. Oh, man. <sighs> I'm going to try it. The least I can do is fail, but I'm going to try. That's okay. I said, I'm going jogging. Who wants to go? And Callie was the only one that wanted to go with me. And Savannah. So I said, no, they wanted to ride their bikes. I said, great. You ride your bikes. I said, hey, I'm going to get down there. And we got down to the bottom. I said, all right, now here's the deal. I made a commitment to Calvin I was going to go up. I said, by the grace of God, I'm going to go up that hill. But girls, I may not make it. I said, you just do your best. You stay ahead. 
And I told him, I said, listen, here's what I'm going to do. As I'm jogging, I go, I'm going to start thinking about people in Cleveland Baptist Church. And I'm going to start thanking God for people. And I'm going to pray while I'm going up that hill. So in my mind, this is what it looked like, right? In my mind, this is what it looks like. Right? I lifted my head and I could see the sign. And I'm like, I'm going to make it. And I'm, I'm, I'm naming off some of you. I'm just like, Lord, thank you for them. Thank you. And I'm just naming them off. And I, I made it up to the top. Felt my heart was going to come out of my body, but I made it up to the top. Now, in reality, in reality, this is probably a little bit more of what it looked like. See, just because we say I'm a runner doesn't actually make me a runner. Just because we say we're a servant of God, just because we say we're a servant of Jesus Christ, it does not make us a servant. The first step of becoming a servant of God is becoming a child of God. On April 22nd, 2002, my son Calvin was born. And he was a child, but he wasn't just any child or anyone's child. Listen, he was a child of Tom and Amanda. See, I want to be a servant of God. See, I'm already a child of God. You realize that? There's absolutely nothing that I can do or not do to make, my, make God love me more or less. But I want, I want what's in him to come out of him into me and make me a servant of God. It's my desire tonight. I want to remind you of the example of a servant that we found in 1 Kings. The obedience of a servant. He said, I have done all these things at thy word. Can you honestly say that tonight? God, I've obeyed in everything you've asked me to do. God, I'm doing all to the, to the, to the best of my ability. Lord, I'm doing everything at your word. Listen, that's going to require us to get, spend more time in his work, in his word. Not just when we're on the clock, preacher. Right? Oh, I've done all things at thy word. But again, notice the, the objective of the servant. It's not to build a name. It's not to build a work. No, no. It's to glorify the Lord. To direct the hearts of the people to the Lord. As, as we sit here today, some of you have been given gifts. And my question to you is, are you, serving, are you a servant of God with the gifts that God has given you? Some of you have the gift of giving. God bless you. You're able to further the work of the Lord. You're able to do great things in the way that you give. Some of you have the gift of volunteering time. You have the ability to come in and to serve. Some of you have the gift of being a prayer warrior. Oh, how we need prayer warriors. I was so encouraged. I, I love Fridays. Not because it's the end of the week. Fridays, are, I, that's the day I get hospital calls. That's the day I get to go visit people and pray with them. And, and I, my dad taught me this a long time ago. We walked into the hospital one time. Miss Clara Cox, she was, uh, had, had a lot of fluid on her lungs, and she was close to, close to dying. And we walked in, and we were talking a little bit, and, and my dad said, well, now you need to start praying. He, he started listening to prayer requests for her to pray for. And, uh, boy, I got back in the car. I said, Dad, I said, why did you give her all those people to pray for? He said, well, she, she can pray. While she's there, she can get her mind off of the things that, that, that are burdening her. She can start praying for, for some things. Boy, we, we, need, we need some prayer warriors. Some of you have a gift, some of you have a, have a gift of encouragement. I'm going to ask, are you a servant of God in the way that you encourage? Some of you have the gift of teaching. Some of you can be a helper in a classroom. Some of you maybe even be called to preach. So here's, here, here's uh, three things. I believe we ought to ask God to make us a servant of Him. I believe we ought to commit or maybe recommit our life to serve him. It'd be good for us maybe just to come around the altar and just thank him. Boy, God, you've been so good to me. Thank you for allowing me to serve. Boy, I love what Pastor preached the other, the other night about just being a cup or a plate. What a great illustration. I'm just a plate. I'm just a cup. I'm just a utensil. There's nothing special about us. Maybe we just come around and we just thank God for allowing us to serve. Two verses come to mind and we'll finish. Proverbs 25, verse 4, the Bible says, Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Now, we grew up watching a little bit of uh, 
Andy Griffith. So when I thought of the word finer, I thought about, you know, the Darling family playing and, and Andy sitting back saying, well, that's real fine. That's real good. That's not what this verse is saying. This verse is talking about the man who is working with the silver. Look back at the verse. Take away the dross, that's sin, from the silver, that's us, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer, that's God. God, you, we need your help to do this. James chapter 4, verse 8, we'll get to this later, but it says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. May God help us to understand and just to do some personal evaluation. God, am I a servant of you and of your Son, Jesus Christ?